Lovely to see you this evening. As Jeff says in the morning, well, I'm sure it's lovely for you to see me as well. You're just keeping it in your hearts. Uh, let's uh, turn to that passage in Luke, Luke 14. Uh, let me pray for us before we begin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Almighty, this God, God, this prayer that Jesus taught us reminds us that it's your name that's to be made holy. It's your kingdom, your will that is to be done. Forgive us our pride for making it all about us. Encourage us now through your words to live humble lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, two presidents, one you know very well, and the other one you have probably never heard of. And so we begin with him, Jose Mujica. Uh, Jose has been nicknamed the world's humblest head of state. Uh, after being elected, he refused to move into the presidential palace uh, or use any of its staff. Instead, he lives on a farm owned by his wife, where they grow and sell chrysanthemums. His mode of transport wasn't a limousine or a bulletproof Cadillac. Instead, it was this 1987 VW Beetle. Each year, uh, government officials in Uruguay have a mandatory personal wealth declaration. Uh, when Jose became president, his wealth was 1,800 US dollars, the value of his car. It was his only asset. Recently, he's been offered 1 million US dollars uh, from an Arab sheik for the car. Uh, he's not sure if he wants to accept, joking that he needs it for his dog, Manuela, uh, who's become famous for only having three legs. There he is there. But if Jose does eventually decide to sell, well, he says he'd donate the money to support a charity that provides housing for the homeless. Well, this comes as no surprise uh, to the man who gave away 90% of his salary while president and who also turned down a pension from his time working as a senator. Well, the other president you'll be very familiar with, it's our very own Jacob Zuma, president of South Africa from 2009 to 2018. Well, Zuma infamously upgraded his Nkandla uh, homestead to the tune of 246 million rand. The Public Protector report found that Zuma unduly benefited from these improvements, uh, which you'll know that he claimed were security upgrades. Well, Zuma has left us a legacy of state capture and corruption, his name forever linked to the arms deal, motions of no confidence, the Guptas, and more recently his arrest and subsequent medical parole. Well, two presidents, polls apart. One lives a, 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 a humble life on a ramshackle farm. The other is proud and arrogant, living a life of luxury on a vast homestead. But before we lay into our ex-president, well, we need to look at our own hearts. Are we guilty of the same thing? Does our pride prevent us from being the disciple of Jesus that he wants us to be? And that we are meant to be. Are we lacking in humility? Well, over the next two weeks, we're going to look at two parables that Jesus told. Uh, both involved a shared meal, a, a party. And tonight, we look at the parable of the wedding feast. And next week, we'll look at the parable of the great banquet. Well, in verse 1, we read that Jesus tells these parables while at the house of an important Pharisee. Well, the invitation seems to have had ulterior motives because they're watching Jesus closely, looking uh, to catch him out if he heals on the Sabbath. Well, we're going to skip that part of the passage. We'll pick it up a little bit next week. But we're going to focus on the parable itself tonight. And so jump ahead to verse 7 and listen to those words of Jesus again. He told the parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit in the place of honor. Because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come to you and say, give your place to this man. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place. So that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble. And, whoever, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, so the Pharisees might be watching Jesus, but Jesus is watching them. And what he sees doesn't impress him very much. But at ancient meals, uh, couches would be usually set out in a U shape. 
with two to four guests reclining at each couch. There was no social distancing. And the host would sit at the base of the U and with the most honored guests to their right and to their left. Well, not much has changed. Royal banquets at Buckingham Palace are set out in exactly the same way. Uh, the queen sits at the base of the U. There she is there, if you can make her out in her colorful outfit, uh, with the most important guest at her right and then the next most important guest at her left. Well, during courses, she alternates who she speaks with, starting way, with the most important person on her right. Well, here's a random fact about the queen's handbag that I found out this week. Uh, she uses it to send secret messages to her staff. Did you know that? Taryn knew it because she's a royalist. Uh, well, these signals help her get out of awkward conversations. If she moves her handbag from her normal spot on her left arm to her right arm while talking to someone, or she wants her staff to know that she wants to wrap things up. Putting her bag on the floor, well, that's a sign that she needs to be rescued ASAP. And if she's at dinner and places it on the table, well, that means she wants to end the event in the next five minutes. Maybe you guys want to no, think about that. Secret signals with your husbands. Um, well, the queen staff need to be observant. Uh, they need to watch out for these signals. And that's exactly what Jesus does. As he observes the guests, well, he notices how they choose the best places for themselves. Those closest to the host, near to the seat of power. And so noticing their behavior, well, he tells this parable of a wedding feast. Well, the parable isn't a difficult one to understand. It employs the same thinking that we saw in the proverb that was read for us earlier. Don't sit in the place of honor in a feast, because if someone more important than you arrives, well, you'll get bumped down to the bottom of the table, publicly shamed and embarrassed. Or rather, start in the lowest place. And that way, the host will honor you when he asks you to move up to a seat of greater honor. And then just in case the meaning of the parable isn't abundantly clear, well, Jesus summarizes it for us in a single sentence. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Simple, right? Practice humility, avoid pride. Got it? Good. But hang on. Why does Jesus make such a big deal about pride? Is pride really that bad? Well, listen to what Jesus says elsewhere in Luke. Luke eleven forty three. 43. Woe to you, Pharisees! You love the front seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. And Luke 20, 46 to 47, beware of the scribes who want to go around in long robes and who love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and say long prayers just for show. These will receive harsher judgment. Well, clearly Jesus has an issue with pride. In fact, in other parts of the Bible, we read that God opposes the proud. But what's the big deal about pride? Well, pride is what caused Satan's downfall. Well, Satan was originally a beautiful angel, perhaps even the highest of all angels. But he wasn't content in his position. Satan desired to be God. He wanted God's throne for himself, and so he rebelled against God. Well, that didn't work out too well for Satan, because only God is God. He's the one who belongs on the throne, not Satan, and certainly not us. And so God cast Satan out of heaven. That didn't put a stop to pride. In fact, this is the only the beginning of the problem. Because Satan tempts Adam and Eve with the same offer. Eat of the forbidden fruit and you will become like God. Adam and Eve eat of the fruit and the sin of pride has infected us ever since. Pharaoh is too proud to let the Israelites go, even at the cost of his firstborn son. Nebuchadnezzar boasts in his pride and he's reduced to behaving like a wild animal, eating grass for seven years. And the scribes and the Pharisees, well, they're proud too, desiring the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. And so the general rule is that pride is a bad thing. There are, however, some exceptions. The Bible teaches us that we can be proud of a job well done. We can express pride over the accomplishments of others. And Paul speaks about having great pride in the Corinthian church. But the pride that the Bible condemns, well, that's the pride of self-righteousness. And God opposes that sort of pride because it's a hindrance to seeking him. And it's this negative aspect of pride that we should seek to avoid. 
Well, there are two problems when it comes to pride. The first is that we tend to recognize it very easily in others, but we fail to see it in ourselves. We have blinkers on when it comes to our own pride. And second, well, pride is often seen as a positive attribute, not a sin. Our world values pride. Pride is a synonym for self-worth. Be proud of yourself. But pride can be a huge stumbling block for Christians. In his book, Respectable Sins, author Jerry Bridges identifies four types of pride to avoid. The first is the pride of moral self-righteousness, a feeling of moral superiority with regards to other people. Well, it's easy for us to fall into this type of pride. Uh, we live in a world that not only condones sin, but actively encourages it. Sexual immorality, divorce, homosexuality, abortion, drunkenness, and greed are all seen as socially acceptable. And because most of us don't commit any of those sins, well, it's easy to look down on others and feel oh, morally superior. Now, it's not that any of those things are right, but in judging the sin of others... Well, we ourselves fall into the sin of moral self-righteousness. The truth is that none of us should feel morally superior to anybody. We can echo the words of David in Psalm 51. I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Rather than look down on others, well, we ought to feel deeply grateful to God. That by His grace He's kept us from or rescued us from living like that. It's a famous phrase, maybe you've heard it. There, but for the grace of God, go I. No one's sure of the origin of the phrase, but it sums up the pride of moral self-righteousness. None of us should boast, or feel superior, or look down on others. Because if God hadn't been merciful to us, well, then we may well be in the same boat. And so the first type of pride to avoid is the pride of moral self-righteousness. Well, a second type of pride to avoid is the pride of achievements. We love achievements, don't we? Whether that's ourselves or our families. Now, there's nothing wrong with achieving something. But there is, if all that we're interested in is being number one, no matter how we get there. And if we fail to acknowledge God in what we've done. Well, Muhammad Ali was perhaps the greatest heavyweight boxer of all time. Once at the height of his fame, he boarded a flight on a Boeing 747. And as the flight was starting to taxi down the runway for takeoff, the flight attendant walked by and noticed that Ali didn't have his seatbelt on. Please fart in your seatbelt, sir, she said. He looked up proudly and replied, Superman don't need no seatbelt. Without hesitation, she stared at him and said, Superman don't need no plane. <laughs> well, Ali had an overinflated opinion of himself. His achievements themselves weren't bad, but it was his, his pride in his achievements that was the problem. And it's the same for us. We're quick to boast in our achievements, much slower to acknowledge God and the abilities he's given us to enable to achieve those things. And if our achievements aren't exactly what we want, well, then there's always the option to put a bit of a spin on them. So when you're telling a story about yourself, there's the temptation to make yourself look good to maybe embellish a few details here and there, put yourself in a better light, to come across more of the hero. We want others to think well of us, to respect us. But the root of that kind of thinking is pride. Look at me. Look how great I am. And Pastor Eric Raymond tells this story. I remember it like it was yesterday. The conversation made such a mark on me, both by stinging my pride and shaping my desire for holiness. My wife and I were taking a walk, enjoying some nice conversation, and then she lovingly asked me a perceptive question. Did you ever notice that you are always the hero of your stories? Knocked me off my feet. My wife was saying that I routinely made myself out to be the hero in all of our talking about life, family, and even ministry. She mentioned how rare it was to hear of my own vices. Instead, she regularly heard of others. Well, that's the second type of pride to avoid, the pride of achievement. Well, the third type of pride to avoid is the pride of correct doctrine. Well, that what I believe is right and what you believe is wrong. So are you an Arminian or a Calvinist? Are you a dispensationist or do you hold to covenantal theology? Infant baptism or believer's baptism? 
Or perhaps you have no idea what I'm talking about. Or for you, doctrine isn't important. And so you look on scorn with others, on others who think otherwise. Well, Paul addresses this type of pride in his letter to the Corinthians. An issue had arisen in the church over food offered to idols. Was it okay for Christians to eat the food or not? Well, some of the Corinthians argued that this fell into the bounds of Christian liberty. What's interesting is that Paul agrees with them theologically, but he disagrees with them morally. The pride of the Corinthians had led them to being puffed up. Their correct doctrine led to a lack of love on their part. And so you may or may not know that St. Stephen's is part of a denomination called Reach South Africa, the Reformed Evangelical Church of South Africa. We evangelicals, that is, we believe the Bible to be true. God's inspired word, and that's something precious to hold on to. But on occasion, this has led to a certain arrogance. We look down on other Christians or other denominations as somewhat inferior, as if we're the only ones preaching the gospel. And so we become self-righteous. We end up judging others. That isn't to say that doctrine isn't important, because it is. But we need to hold our doctrinal convictions with humility. There are plenty of godly and wise people who hold different opinions from us. I'm not talking about the false teachers, right? You stay away from the false teachers. But we're brothers and sisters in Christ have a differing view to us. Well, we need to be humble. Because it might well be us who are wrong. We need to avoid the pride of correct doctrine. Well, fourth type of pride to avoid is that of an independent spirit. Well, this expresses itself in resistance to authority. And those who suffer from this type of pride are unteachable. And so you may have heard of the phrase, ask a teenager while they still know everything. <laughs> I'm sure we all know people like that, not the teenagers among us, but people who are experts under the sun, and aren't they a pain? <laughs> well, Jerry Bridges tells a story of how when he was young and single, he lived with two different families who had children. He says, and I remember with shame how I used to silently judge their child rearing. What pride. Young and single with absolutely no experience in rearing children, yet I thought I knew more than they did. Well, we see this type of pride manifest itself in our life groups. So your group is discussing a passage of the Bible when someone pipes up, well, I think such and such. They aren't actually interested in what the Scripture teaches. This is just the person's opinion. But in their mind... That opinion has weight. It has authority. There's no willingness to grapple with the Bible, no desire for God to teach them through his word. It's the pride of an independent spirit, and we should avoid it. But if we to avoid pride, well, we need to replace it with something else. The Bible always tells us that we should put something off when then we should put something else on. And that is, we should replace bad habits with good habits. And so not only do we need to avoid pride, but we also need to seek humility. We need to humble ourselves. And the first way that we can do it is by acknowledging God. So your child makes the first team. Well, how about saying, well, we're so grateful to God that he's blessed our child with a talent for sports. We're thankful to God that our family has the opportunity to be at a school with such great facilities. And we know how much hard work that the coach has been putting in. Or you get that promotion at work. I'm grateful to God for all the skills that he's given me. I thank God that he's provided me with a job. I'm grateful to my boss for trusting me with this extra responsibility. That's how to work on humility. Shift the focus and attention off yourself and onto where it belongs, onto God. Acknowledge the fact that without God, well, we're completely helpless. We're completely reliant on God for everything. And so we ought to humbly acknowledge God in everything. A second way to seek humility is to think of yourself less. C.S. Lewis famously once said, Humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. To be humble is to put others above yourself. It's to place their needs above your own. So many of you will have heard of Hudson Taylor, uh, the great missionary who founded the China Inland Mission, now OMF. The story goes that two women in Shanghai were discussing the topic of pride and began to wonder if Taylor was ever tempted to be prideful because of all his great achievements. 
and many accomplishments. One of the women decided to ask Taylor's wife, Maria, when she promised the woman that she'd find out. But when she asked her husband if he was ever tempted to be proud, he was surprised. Proud about what, he asked. About all the things that you've done, she explained. And Taylor responded, I never knew I'd done anything. <laughs> well, that's thinking of yourself less. And then third or finally, our example of humility is found in Jesus. The humility of Jesus is wonderfully captured by the Apostle Paul in this famous passage from the book of Philippians. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Well, the point isn't a difficult one to understand. The all-powerful king of the universe willingly became human. All God's power and might and wisdom crammed into a man. Immortality clothed with mortality. And in that same God, allowed himself to be executed by the very ones he came to save. Well, if you're looking for the ultimate act of humility, well, this is it. You don't get any more humble than God dying for you. And Jesus never demands of his followers more than he himself was willing to bear. It's not like he teaches us to be humble while he lives a life of luxury and fame. No, he takes on the very nature of a servant. He shows us exactly what it means to humble himself. So if you're struggling with humility, well, be reminded of the example of Jesus. Put him on your to-do list and let his example motivate your actions. Andrew Murray, the South African pastor who died just over 100 years ago, said this, Humility toward others will be the only sufficient proof that our humility before God is real. That humility has taken up its abode in us and become our very nature. Now Jesus isn't calling us to a false humility in this passage, in this parable. We aren't to go to the lowest place expecting to be bumped up, or even desiring that. Humility doesn't envy or boast. Humility gives up on the comparison game. Humility seeks the lowest place. Humility serves. To be humble is to lead a life of service to others. At a church I used to attend, uh, there was a man who would come and clean the toilets once a week. We didn't pay him for it. In fact, he had an office job in the city. But he knew that it needed to be done, and so he volunteered. Almost no one knew who he was or what he did. All we knew was that the toilets were clean on a Sunday. He received no credit for doing what could only have been a pretty unpleasant task. But he did it anyway. I was always blown away by his humility, by his servant heart. And what does humility look like for you when you come to church on a Sunday? Do you expect everyone to come and greet you because you're so important? Or do you make an effort to welcome the newcomer in our midst? Do you complain when there isn't someone at the door to greet you or serve you hot chocolate? Or do you jump in to help? And what does humility look like for you this week? How could you serve someone else? Maybe you could buy a small gift for the person who cleans your office or cleans your home. Write them a little thank you note to say how much you appreciate them. Well, the only way we're going to serve others is if we think of ourselves less, if we humble ourselves. Well, the legendary King Arthur was famous for his sword, uh, but he was also famous for his table. And the shape of his table was? Round. Round. There you go. Well, the reason for a round table is that everyone has equal status. There's no room for pride. It's the table the guests of the Pharisee Jesus tells this parable to desperately need. Their pride is their downfall. Let it not be ours. Instead, let's practice humility. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We might not see that in our lifetime. The humble are often scorned and looked down upon, while the proud are held up by our society. But when Jesus returns, 
And those who have exalted themselves in this life will find themselves humbled in the next. But those who have humbled themselves, who have placed their faith in Jesus and what he has done, instead of their own achievements, well, they will be exalted, given places of honor in the new heaven and the new earth. What Jesus calls us to practice humility and to avoid pride, will we obey? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you enjoyed the eternal delight of the Godhead and the adoration and esteem of angels, and yet you emptied yourself and became a man, despised and rejected for us. Your humility astounds us. We are in awe of you and of what you've done. And so as we hear these words of yours today, may we be reminded to follow in your steps to avoid pride and practice humility. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Jeff Gertson. I'm the senior pastor at St. Stephen's Church, and I'd love to get to know you. Why don't you subscribe? Click our subscribe button. If you'd like to get to know a little bit more about Jesus, why don't you click on this video on this side? Or if you'd like to get to know a little bit more about our church, then click on this video over here. Thanks for watching. I look forward to hearing from you.